Okay, welcome back everyone. We're at our third session within the Nutrient Summit. Uh, please don't forget to tweet your comments in the chat at pncwaorg. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Adam Klein. He's a wastewater process engineer specializing in the planning, design, and process optimization of wastewater treatment plants. He has over 15 years of experience in the industry working with Brown and Caldwell. Adding, Adam will be speaking about the benefits of nutrient mass balance. Adam, the floor is yours. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, so yeah, I'm happy to be here uh, at the uh, Summit Series talking nutrients. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about what's called a whole plant nutrient balance. And uh, this is a tool that I've been developing for a long time. Um, basically helping me to kind of track the flow of nutrients within a treatment plant. I find this really useful, uh, really for any plant that's got any sort of nutrient issue. Uh, today, I'm going to be uh, really focused on struvite. So let's just jump right in. We can go to the, the next slide. So quick agenda. I'm going to start out with a little bit of an intro, and then I've got a couple of mass balance examples that we'll walk through and stuff that's hopefully uh, pretty useful uh, to everyone here listening in, and uh, we'll, we'll touch upon some of the struvite mitigation alternatives. Next slide. So uh, why do we care about nutrients? Well, since you're all here at the Nutrient Summit, you probably all, all do care about nutrients, but uh, really um, you, know, you could have an environmental interest in the sense of uh, what nutrients are doing to our water bodies with uh, eutrophication. Um, some of you have a more pressing interest in the sense that you may have a nutrient regulation uh, at your facility. And then, uh, you know, a lot of you uh, may just have nutrient issues at the plant uh, with uh, O&M issues, uh, for example, uh, struvite. So uh, next slide. So what I've kind of been, been digging into is what happens within the plant with these nutrients. We know they're coming in, we know they're coming out, but what's really going on inside the plant? And there's a lot of things that are going on. Uh, we got solids liquid separation. You got some processes that are causing hydrolysis and release. Um, your cells are growing. They're picking up nutrients. Um, cells are being destroyed <laughs> and releasing nutrients. And then you got metal precipitation, which can really happen anywhere within your plant. Uh, so next slide. So before I dive into the balance, just a, a little bit of background on struvite. Uh, most of you know all this stuff, but uh, for those that don't, struvite is a precipitate that forms uh, when three things are present, uh, ammonia, uh, orthophosphate, that's PO4, and magnesium. And when these three things are present uh, in the right conditions, uh, it will form a precipitate, um, tends to form at places where pressure changes, so think pumps, uh, pipe elbows, impellers, mixers, that kind of stuff. Uh, prefers uh, high pH, the sweet spot is around 8.5 and prefers higher temperatures as well. Uh, next slide. So uh, what does it do? Why do we care? Uh, well, what it does is it just builds up and it builds up everywhere, on pipes, on pumps, uh, you see some pictures of a heat exchanger there where it's just completely clogged, uh, the pipes. Uh, it can accumulate in digesters. Uh, you know, you may think you have a million gallons of digester, but actually, um, you know, you only have 750,000 gallons because the rest of it is all struvite. Uh, so it, it can really reduce your active volume. Um, some of you may not know, but, uh, you know, struvite on its own could be actually a, a valuable uh, resource. Uh, the nutrients are, are good for fertilizer. So depending on the form uh, you have it in, uh, you can market the stuff for $100 to $1,000 per ton. So it, it can have some benefit. Next slide. So um, to understand you know, what's happening to these nutrients within the plant, uh, I started building this mass balance. And this is the work of many years uh, we've done some really detailed nutrient characterizations at a bunch of different treatment plants. Uh, I got some vendors involved, uh, giving me data from all over the world. And we've you know, put together this mass balance, which is really just a tool to help us uh, compare risk, uh, compare options, 
and track, you know, where are the nutrients accumulating in your plant? You know, where should you focus your uh, resources for treating or for mitigating struvite risk? So next slide. We can go to the next slide. Okay, great. So um, the way we've got this set up now, uh, the model doesn't require any real uh, sophisticated inputs. You know, we put in a flow, some basic information about the plant, um, you know, primary uh, performance, um, capture rates, digester performance, a pretty simple suite of information. And we can, you know, calibrate this model for almost any, any treatment plan. So uh, if we go to the next slide, um, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to keep coming back to this process flow. And as we go, I'm going to populate it uh, with our nutrient fluxes. So this is just a generic plant, um, you know, pretty typical here. And uh, with this first example, what I'm going to do is something you know, a lot of you may have experience with. And that's, you know, what happens when you shift a plant from just regular old BOD removal to biological phosphorus removal? Okay, what, what do you expect is going to happen there? Um, you know, where are you at the most risk for struvite? So let's, let's kind of walk through this um, if we can. So go to the next slide. Okay, so this is your BOD removal plan. So we're not trying to remove phosphorus here. And uh, first, okay, let's look at the green text. Okay, so what's coming in the plant, you've got 1,000 pounds a day of phosphorus. And if you move over to the right, you can see what's going out. So this is not a pea removal plant. So most of that phosphorus is just passing right on through. We got 750 pounds a day coming out. And then the rest of it down below is going into your biosolids. What I wanna focus on here is the red, okay? Cause I'm really interested in what's happening internally inside the plant. And what you'll see here is that within the digester you're converting a whole bunch of particulate phosphate or particulate phosphorus into PO4P. And if you see the two red numbers there around the dewatering system, you know, this is where you would have your struvite risk. And we're looking at 300, 350 pounds a day of ortho P. Um, as your dewatering filtrate comes back to the primary clarifiers and then gets to your BNR system, we're loading it up with say a thousand pounds a day. So kind of, you know, remember these numbers because the next slide I'm going to show you what happens when we shift this plant to biological phosphorus removal. So let's shift to the next slide. Okay, so now we've got a BioP plant. So let's first, you've got the same influent coming in, but now you look at the effluent, okay? So we're removing almost all the phosphorus. This plant is doing great, okay? Uh, very little phosphorus in the effluent. You can see it's all getting partitioned to the biosolids. But what does this do inside our plant. Okay, now look at the red numbers here. So down, coming out of the digester now, and before we had 300 pounds a day of PO4P. Okay, now we're looking at 1250, okay? Uh, in our filtrate, our centrate, we're over a thousand pounds a day of PO4P. And then, you know, look up at what's loading into your secondary process. We've got uh, 1600 pounds a day of PO4P coming in there. So if you're you know, trying to meet a phosphorus regulation and you're doing the best you can, uh, now you get hit with this kind of a load to your secondary process. I mean, it's gonna make life so much harder. Uh, now you're gonna have to, you know, increase the amount of carbon. You may have to buy some acetate, you know, so it's just huge implications throughout the plant. So let's, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so looking in, in terms of concentrations, uh, how do things compare? So we got our BOD removal plant at the top and our P removal plant at the bottom. And let's look here at the secondary influent. So with the BOD plant, we got four, five, six milligrams per liter of phosphorus. Uh, and now we shift to BioP and we're double. Okay, we're nine, 10 milligrams per liter. So again, it's that much harder to meet a phosphorus regulation. Then down at the bottom, I mean, if you've got concentrations of 1,000 milligrams per liter of PO4P, you're going to have massive struvite problems. Okay, that's just way, way too high. Uh, so this kind of shows you, you know, how you can use this tool to compare a couple of situations. So, um, you know, let's move on. Let's go to the next slide. 
And uh, you know, I'm going to kind of shift gears now and talk about how do we how do we reduce this risk. Okay, and one thing I, I kind of want to do uh, for those of you listening in here, um, you know, maybe within the chat. If you're having struvite issues at your plant, it'd be interesting to know, you know, where you're having them. You know, where where's your struvite building up? And then when we get to Q and A, maybe Rick can can comment on kind of, you know, where where that survey goes. Um, so, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, how can you mitigate that? And um, you know, there's kind of the tried and true methods of mitigation uh, in terms of chemical precipitation. And then more recently, we've had a whole a whole bunch of vendor uh, processes that have have come up. So let's let's walk through these really quickly. So next slide. So traditionally, um, you know, plants that have tried to um, you know mitigate struvite issues have really focused on um, metal addition. Okay. Uh, so if we just click to the next slide, this will just kind of show you where it's going. So. You, what you're doing here is you're taking a metal, whether it's ferric, alum, you know, other metals, you can add it uh, really, you know, to a bunch of different locations throughout the biosolid stream. And this stuff will bind up your um, phosphate, okay? It'll form iron phosphate complexes that will then get carried through into your biosolids product. Okay, so it's a, it's a way to get rid of your uh, potential for struvite. Uh, the problem with this, um, number one, it costs a lot of money because um, you're you know, continually buying all this chemical that you have to add, and then you're not getting any benefit. You know, it's kind of just forming these metal complexes that just end up in your in your product. So there was a, a place there for these um, these vendors to come in and, and maybe find a more efficient way of dealing with struvite. So let's go to the next slide. So a bunch of vendors have come out with uh, struvite recovery processes. And uh, the way these things work is they're actually trying to form struvite. So what they do is they, they pick a point in the treatment process and they add a bunch of magnesium. They optimize the pH. So they're kind of aiming for that eight and a half kind of range. And then they design a reactor that is optimized for crystallization and uh, pellet formation. Uh, some of these systems will generate a really nice fertilizer product. You see some photos on there of what this could look like. Um, others say, well, hey, you know, if you don't want to deal with that, um, you could just let the stuff go into your biosolids. And then you have this uh, essentially fertilizer product already mixed in uh, with your biosolids. Uh, so there's a lot of different options. Uh, on the next slide, if we can go there, you can see that. Um, Different vendors will put the system in at different places. Um, there are some that will treat the digested sludge. This would be like your Airprex system, which is now called Magprex or a Neuresis system. Uh, you have some processes that will treat your dewatering filtrate. This would be the traditional Astara process, Fospac, Neuresis. Um, Ostara has a, a WASTRIP process where they'll actually, uh, you know, add a treatment process for the waste activated sludge. Then Kelprex is where you actually take the combined sludges and pretreat it in an acid phase digester. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different options and I find a lot of times it's hard to, to really understand, well, you know, what are the differences? Uh, what are the pros and cons? And that you know, really led me to kind of develop this mass balance model to try to help me and help my clients figure out, you know, well, how do we compare these, these systems? So what we're going to do with the next few slides is I'm going to continue uh, showing you those process flow diagrams, the same system we showed before, only now we're going to show what happens when you put in each of these different systems. Okay, so let's go to the first one. Okay. So here we go, we got a digested sludge treatment process here. And you can see it highlighted in yellow down at the bottom. Uh, so what I wanna draw your attention to here is we look at the digester, okay? What's coming out of the digester, you got a thousand pounds a day of phosphorus, about 600 of it in PO4P form. It goes into this process and look what's coming out, okay? You're removing 90% of the orthophosphate. So very little, uh, orthophosphate load to your dewatering system. Uh, your dewatering filtrate is, you know, really, really low in phosphorus. 
you know, so you've essentially protected that system from struvite. Okay, you're not going to be getting struvite accumulation in your dewatering process. Um, you can see um, down below, instead of kind of dividing our phosphate out between the effluent and the biosolids, now what we're doing is we're generating this struvite product. Okay, so effectively, Lee, we're removing this source of accumulation of phosphorus within the plant and we're continually pulling phosphorus out. And what that does, it reduces your phosphate level everywhere. Okay, look at our secondary process. Uh, 750, 500 pounds a day hitting our BNR activated sludge. Well, that's one third of what it was without this process. Okay, look at the digester. Okay, we're at nine, you know, 990 coming in, you know, before we were well over a thousand. Our ortho P was 1200 or so. Okay, so this, you know, not only are you protecting the dewatering system, but you're getting this benefit of just removing this kind of uh, cyclic, uh, you know, routing of phosphorus throughout your plant. Okay, so what would happen if we put this system on the filtrate stream? Okay, let's move to the next slide. Okay, so here we go. So now we've moved it to our filtrate. And what you'll notice here is now the dewatering system is getting a phosphate load. Okay, so now instead of it being, you know, insignificant, now you've got 600 or so pounds of PO4P at your dewatering system. Is that going to form struvite? Kind of depends on the situation, um, but it's definitely going to be a higher risk than the previous system. Um, but this system has many of the same benefits. You can see you're producing a lot of struvite, you're removing that you know, feedback loop, uh, your secondary influent numbers are relatively low and your digester numbers aren't terribly different from what they were uh, with the previous system. So the big difference here is just whether you're putting this ahead or behind of dewatering. Now, what would happen if we added that waste activated sludge treatment system? Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here we got something like a WAS strip. You're taking your WAS, you're sending it to a phosphorus release tank. And now what you'll notice is you've got two different streams going to your struvite recovery process. You've got one stream coming from the WAS, you got one stream coming from the filtrate. So what does this do? Okay, well, number one, it increases the amount of struvite you're pulling out. Okay, this is the highest amount of struvite product we've seen. And because you're pulling more out, you're getting a benefit all over the plant. You've got lower secondary influent levels, lower digester levels, and lower levels hitting your dewatering process. You're still not at the you know, 50 pounds a day where we were at before uh, with your dewatering process, but you are reaping all these other benefits throughout the plant. So let's roll this up into a comparison. Okay, next slide. So here we're looking at concentrations and uh, what we're looking at here, we're kind of moving our way down. So the top row, we're looking at our BOD removal plant. Okay, this plant is not removing phosphorus, probably not having much of a struvite issue, although you know, a lot of BOD removal plants do. Um, but you can see there, you know, your secondary influent TP is six milligrams per liter. Your digester dewatering load are in the 300s. You know, it's not, not terribly brutal. When we shift to biological phosphorus removal, everything goes in the red. Okay, now we've got 11 milligrams per liter hitting our secondary influent. So that's affecting your carbon demand for phosphorus removal. And we've got these huge concentrations in our biosolid system. So we're at, at a huge risk for struvite. With the digested sludge treatment option, you can notice everything gets a lot better. And in particular, our dewatering system uh, is fully protected from struvite. With the filtrate system, it also looks really good. The main difference there is just whether or not you're you know, upstream or downstream of dewatering. But then down at the bottom, you know, we, we take our filtrate treatment and we add a P release tank. And now you see you know, the lowest concentrations in the digester, almost to the point, almost back to where we were with just BOD removal. Um, the dewatering concentration, again, is almost back to where we were with just BOD removal. Um, and our secondary influent uh, for all these processes is actually lower than we were uh, for the BOD removal plant.
So a lot of benefits um, for all these systems. And it gives you a little sense of how you could compare the systems to each other. So let's go ahead to the, uh, the next slide. So, uh, you know, what does this mass balance do for you, okay? Um, I'm gonna start at the bottom of this slide because what it won't do is it, it's not gonna actually tell you, you know, exactly how much screw light you're gonna form, okay? If you really wanna know, you know, am I or am I not gonna get screw light definitively, uh, you need some very sophisticated uh, chemical <laughs> equilibrium modeling to do that. And even then, you know, it's a question of, you know, are you going to get an exact answer ever? Okay, this is a very complicated thing to model. Uh, what this mass balance type tool is going to do, it's going to allow you to compare alternatives. It's going to give you an idea of risk. If you, you know, do this, if you put in size stream treatment, if you, you know, put in a struvite recovery system, you know, how is it going to change your situation and change your risk? Okay, so those are the real benefits of what it's going to do. Um, if we go to the next slide, the last slide I have here, uh, I do want to say, you know, I've kind of focused on Struvite here, but I use this tool uh, all the time for, um, you know, nutrient control, uh, plants that are, are looking at ways to remove phosphorus and also nitrogen, okay? Um, with nitrogen, um, there's often the question of side stream treatment. You know, what, what can side stream treatment do for me? Okay, in this type of tool, uh, really lets you visualize that. So here's a typical nitrogen removal plant. And all I want to show you here is just how much of the load uh, ends up concentrated in these side streams. Okay, so in this example, we've got 25% of our ammonia is coming in, you know, from releasing the digester and through the dewatering filtrate to our secondary process. Okay, so this can really uh, give you a real clear idea of what something like size stream treatment can do uh, to help you with nitrogen. So, uh, you know, we use it for nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, it's really useful for struvite control. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, this has kind of maybe helped uncover the black box of, you know, what's happening to all these nutrients uh, within the treatment plan. So that's all I got. I'm going to uh, kind of hand it back over to Rick uh, to get us into the Q&A. So thanks, everybody. And uh, yeah, Rick, let's go. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, Adam. Uh, great talk. So uh, again, keep posting those questions in the chat. We do have a few here that, uh, that we can ask Adam. Uh, the first one from Michelle at King County. Um, what's the typical return on investment for a struvite recovery system? That's, that's, a, good, that's a good question. Um, it kind of depends. Um, it depends on the system you get. So. The big question with the struvite recovery system is, are you going to uh, market the product or not? Okay. Uh, if you're going to market the product, you know, the question is, well, are you going to market yourself? Or are you going to have the vendor market it for you? Okay. So there's, you know, that's one question. The second question I would point out is if you're just looking at this kind of system for struvite alone, uh, your return on investment isn't going to be as great as if you are kind of getting the benefit of this for struvite as well as for phosphorus removal. Well, we see this being, you know, super competitive and really cost effective are plants that, you know, number one, want to fix their struvite problem. And number two, want to reduce the amount of carbon they need to buy uh, to drive bio P. Okay, so that's where these systems can really be, I mean, payback periods of just a couple of years, really. Uh, so it, it depends on your situation, but those are some of the considerations that go into it. Okay, great. Um, from Jason Flowers, uh, does struvite recovery impact the fertilizer quality of the final biosolids? It definitely does. Yeah, I mean, so again, um, you know, going into what I just said, if you've got a system that is actively removing the struvite um, from your biosolids, then yeah, you're going to see less phosphorus in your biosolids because now you've got this separate fertilizer product. If you have one of the systems that just allows the crystals to stay in your biosolids, then what you'll actually see is probably a better biosolids product because now you have this long release, you know, slow release phosphorus baked into your product. So it's kind of a, a plus or minus there. You know, on the one hand, you have a product that you can actively market and maybe make some money off of. On the other hand, 
you, know, you have an enhanced biosolids product of your own. So that's, that's the choice, the trade-off. Okay. Uh, also from Jason, um, what's the minimum size plant you'd recommend uh, for considering a struvite recovery process? Oh, wow. So, you know, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, historically, these systems haven't proven too cost effective unless there was, you know, a high enough amount of orthophosphate in the return stream to justify, you know, generating a marketable product. You know, I've definitely looked at this for some plants in say the, you know, five MGD range, and it's really hard for it to be cost effective if you're not getting that double whammy of, you know, mitigating struvite issues and, you know, helping with your bio P removal. Um, you know, these products, they, they do scale down. I mean, some of these systems can get relatively small, so I, I don't know if there's really a lower limit for it, but it does become a little bit harder to, um, you know, to justify it, to make a business case for if you don't have a ton of phosphate in your, in your return stream. Okay. Uh, when would you pursue a harvesting option versus just leaving the product in the biosolids? So, you know, this, this comes down to your utility um, and it also comes down to your relationship with the vendor. Uh, if you are really, um, you know, engaged in marketing a product and want to get in the fertilizer business, I think it's a great option. Um, if, you know, you, you take the option to have the vendor just take care of it, you know, the vendor will actually buy the product off you. They'll set up a contract with you so you're kind of guaranteed a place to, to send it, you know, and you get a benefit from that. Um, you know, I think it, if you just don't want to deal with it at all, you can just leave it in your biosolids, you know, so it really just comes down to the philosophy you have, whether you want to actively market it yourself and get the most profit you can, whether you want to totally write it off to the vendor and maybe get a little credit on the system, or whether you just don't want to deal with it at all and say, you know what, I'm going to let it go to my biosolids and reap the benefit there. Okay, uh, another question that we had was, um, what is the initial price range and annual maintenance cost for some of these systems? Is that something you know? I mean, it depends on the size. Um, you know, I, I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna to really go too crazy here getting into numbers, but I mean, it, I've seen them, you know, a million dollars, uh, two million. It depends on the size of the plant it is. Um, you know, they're, they're not, I would say they're not cheap. Um, you know, it's definitely an investment and anyone considering it should, should really do a business case type evaluation looking at, you know, long-term. Um, my experience, again, uh, where these really pay off is the situations where you get that synergy between improving BioP and removing struvite. If you're just trying to do one or the other, it's gonna to be tougher uh, to make it cost effective. Not impossible, but tougher. Yeah, okay. A uh, question from David at the city of Eugene. Are there operational strategies to promote free flow formation of the struvite that makes it easier to remove versus the crystal adhering to the piping? Uh, you know, I, I think there probably are. Um, you know, I, I can't offhand think of any tried and true, you know, examples of that. I um, mean, there are certain things, I, I've definitely seen places where plants have maybe put in like a sacrificial uh, run of pipe, you know, with a lot of bends in it. And they just say, you know what, we're going to let our struvite accumulate here and we're just going to replace this pipe every six months, you know, something like that. Um, you know, you, you could end up removing some struvite. Um, I don't know long-term, you know, if that's going to really, you know, be a solution, uh, but I, I've seen some plants that do that as a way of, you know, protecting other areas of their plant. Okay. Uh, we do have time for a few more, so you can keep typing those questions in. We did have one great comment from Carol Nelson at King County that I wanted to point out, and that's that uh, when you are considering the harvesting versus uh, the sequestration, leaving it in the sludge, you need to be considering um, things like land application limits for phosphorus if you do land apply your biosolids. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's about all the time we do have for the Q&A session right now. Uh, so thank you again, Adam. Uh, and again, Adam will be available 
um, uh, at the end of the session with for the general Q&A that we'll have with everybody. Uh, at this point, we're gonna take a quick 15 minute break uh, before the next session. Uh, I wanna thank all the speakers that we've had so far this morning, and again, the sponsors that have made the summit possible. Uh, we'll see you at 1040 uh, for the integrated planning and in the intersection of nutrients, toxics, unrelated compounds, and climate change session. Thank you. <laughs>